Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's NeuroTools webinar. I'm here with Dr. Randy Vita, who will be speaking to us today about the Immune Epitope Database and Analysis Resource. Uh, Dr. Vita is the Lead Ontology and Qu Quality Manager at the Immune Epitope Database and Analysis Project, which is located at the La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immu Immunology in San Diego, California. She spent the past 12 years involved in the curation of immunological data, the design and implementation of the IEDB database and website, and the integration of ontologies into the IEDB and other related projects. Her primary focus has been the use of ontologies to standardize data capture, facilitate interoperability between projects, and generate data validation. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand the reins over to Dr. Vita. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. So I've been at the IEDB forever, since the beginning pretty much. And I'm gonna go into uh, what type of data we have and how we store it and how it can be searched. And it's not uh, purely a neurological um, database, but we do have neurological related data also. So this is a free online resource, the NIAID pays for it, and it just exists as something that anyone can access online and search, and you can download all of our data. We exist just to be free and helpful. So our goal is to get data into the hands of uh, researchers so that they can uh, save money and time and do better research themselves. So because we're NIAID sponsored, uh, our primary focus is allergy, infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, and transplant and alloantigens, because those are the main uh, focus of NIAID. So what is an epitope, starting at the very beginning? So it's the portion of a pathogen, allergen, or autoantigen that the immune system recognizes. So antibodies and T cells have to bind to these epitopes to trigger an immune response. Sorry, just checking the chat. <laughs> so when antibodies and T cells bind their epitopes, this triggers immune response that either protects you or uh, causes an allergic reaction or causes an autoimmune disease. So antibodies typically bind to discontinuous residues of proteins. I don't know if my mouse shows up on the screen, but the colored amino acids in this uh, influenza- It does plate. show up, I can see it, just a okay, heads up. Okay, good. So the colored amino acids, uh, in this influenza protein uh, might be bound by different antibodies. So you may have an antibody that binds to the red and yellow uh, residues, and that antibody would protect you from this flu molecule. But if next year uh, the flu mutates and the two yellow residues are now different amino acids, the antibody might lose its ability to bind and recognize and neutralize this protein. And so that's why you need a new flu vaccine every year because we need, they need to include which epitopes are in this year's strain each year in the vaccine so that your immune system will still be able to recognize these proteins when they encounter the flu and you get sick. And then T cells, they typically recognize uh, peptides that are processed by uh, antigen presenting cells. So there's cells in the body that have the role of antigen presenting cell and what they do is they process uh, viral particles, pollen particles, uh, bacteria, break them into little pieces, and then those pieces are presented on the surface of the antigen presenting cell. And the T cell comes along and it has a T cell receptor that recognizes both the epitope and this MHC molecule that's presenting the peptide. And different uh, groups of humans express different uh, MHC molecules genetically. And so it's really important the combination of which MHC does the patient have and which epitope is being recognized by the T cell. Hmm. Next is not working. <laughs> Try this. All right. So why do epitopes matter? Um, I already mentioned vaccine design. So it's really important to get the epitopes that your immune system is going to recognize in your vaccines, and you don't need the other components in the vaccine. If the immune system doesn't recognize them, they don't need to be present. And in the field of allergy immunotherapy, it's the opposite. You want to dampen the immune response rather than heighten it. So by knowing which epitopes of an allergen the T cell is reacting to, you can uh, slowly tolerate someone to those regions and just uh, teach the immune system to stop overreacting. And in immunogenicity, 
This is where someone's developing a new product. Is that something that will go in or on the body and you don't want an adverse reaction. You don't want an allergic response um, to your product because you don't want it to get sued or you don't want it to fail trials. So by understanding in advance what epitopes are likely to be recognized and the components of whatever you're creating, you can mutate them or alter them so that the immune system will be less likely to recognize them. And in the field of transplantation, it's the epitopes on the donor's tissues and cells that the recipient's immune system recognizes when they reject it. And you know um, which epitopes are present in the donor pool and you know which epitopes are likely to be recognized by the recipients. And that's why they type people and come up with good donor recipient pairs to have better outcomes. So epitopes do matter quite a bit. So we make that NIH would like to have a database of this data. So the IDB was created um, as a contract that should exist forever, like PubMed or PDB. And it has currently more than 99% of all published epitope data from the literature. And we add new data every week. And it, currently it amounts to more than 19,000 uh, references, amounting to more than 1.6 million experimental assays. And primarily from the literature, but we do also accept direct submissions from authors who have a huge amount of data that they're not gonna publish all of it or uh, some authors who have NIH epitope discovery contracts are required to submit their data to the IEDB. And we also host epitope prediction tools, and one of my colleagues is gonna give a talk on that um, in the future. So uh, in general, we have most of the data from the literature, and we, when we started, there was an enormous backlog because we have everything from the beginning of PubMed until now. So it took us many years to catch up with all of the data that was out there. But now we're primarily adding new data. And this pie graph shows that most of the data we have is infectious disease, um, with autoimmunity being the second most common. And we're entirely at the mercy of what authors publish. So if suddenly um, allergy became more popular, then we would have more popular, we would have more allergy data in the IDB. We just, this reflects what is in the literature, and that's, uh, essentially where we get our data from. And within um, autoimmunity, we do have um, quite a bit of uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's uh, research, and we have uh, a lot of experimental encephalitis research from mice or MS. And the scope is the IDB. I mentioned before, it's infectious disease, allergy, autoimmunity, transplant. Um, we specifically do not curate HIV and cancer because they have different funding sources. Um, but we will include HIV and cancer epitopes if they're in a paper that shows a 3D structure of a receptor binding to it, or it has a known um, antibody of T-cell receptor sequence, or if those occur in papers that are about the other main categories. We will cure, when we create a paper, we create everything in it. So if it includes HIV and same uh, flu, we would capture all of those epitopes. And all the data in the IDB is experimentally confirmed. Uh, we don't do predictions and we don't do review papers that uh, show data that was previously published, uh, but we do capture negative data. This is very useful uh, for doing prediction tools, but also helping people know how often something's already been tested and thoroughly proven to be negative. It can help save uh, costs for future experiments when you see that. And then uh, supplemental data is where most of the data actually comes from, because people don't tend to publish um, 6,000 epitope sequences in their regular paper. So each of the experiments in the IDB reflect the binding of an adaptive immune receptor, which is an antibody or T-cell, uh, to an epitope. And we also include MHC binding and MHC ligand elution assays, because these reflect the first step in getting the T-cell to recognize the epitope. So all the data in the IDB is epitope specific, uh, but once we know that a receptor is epitope specific, we capture everything that that receptor did in that paper. So say if an antibody is shown to be epitope specific and then it also neutralizes whole virus, it also binds to a protein in an ELISA, we would capture um, all of those experiments. And if an antibody specific to an epitope from one bacteria also binds to another bacteria, we would capture both of those contexts also. So it's the entirety of what epitope specific receptors have been shown to do in a publication. So the data comes from the literature, it's hidden in tables and figures, and then it's structured into our database format by our team of curators. And the goal of doing this structured curation is so that all this data is easily searchable and findable in one place, and people don't have time to read all of the papers that were ever came before, but they can very quickly do a query and see this data in a structured way. 
So there are types of experiments, the MHC groups, and then the T cell responses and the antibody responses are what our curators um, create from the literature. And then the direct submissions are submitted into our same um, database structure. So for the data to get from the literature into the database, we had to come up with some minimum criteria of what we would include so that we can be consistent uh, across all of the literature and across all of our different team members. So we um, decided upon 50 amino acids or less in length to be what would be the minimum epitope. So if uh, authors usually determine a nine amino acid length is the true epitope or they determine discontinuous residues is the true epitope, but we'll take all data where it's anything 50 amino acids in length less that was tested or uh, for non-peptidic epitopes, these are chemicals like carbohydrates and lipids, if they're less than 5,000 Daltons, those also get included. And then for any experiment to get into the IDB, there's a minimum amount of information that we require. Uh, primarily for linear epitope sequences, we must know the absolute sequence they used. They can't just say um, residue positions because there's a lot of variety in nature. We must know the outcome of the assay. Was it positive or negative binding? That's really important. And then the hosts. If we don't know who's the means response for measuring, it's not worth capturing. So this is our curation process. We start with PubMed and we do a query every two weeks and finding just epitope related data. And we have an automated classifier that uh, runs the abstracts and tells us which category they are so that we know whether or not they're relevant truly to the IDB. And about 70% of those turn out to be curatable. And I want to apologize that these numbers are refreshed um, every year in October. So these are the numbers from last October. So they'll be slightly off from what we currently have. But once the abstracts are processed, they go to our team and each our team member will read the entire publication, enter all of the data from that paper, and then another curator will read the paper, same paper and read everything the first curator entered and that they will work together until the data, they agree upon how the data is done and it will be put onto the website every week. And there's validation steps that occur while it's being curated and again before it's sent to the public site. So our consistency and quality control measures are something that matter a lot to me because with different people, there's a lot of different ways of looking at things. So we have a team of PhD scientists and a special um, chemist uh, curator at Kebby and at the EBI so that the data can be entered with some accuracy. Originally when the project started, we used um, graduate students and master students and they were not capable of truly interpreting the papers uh, consistently because they didn't have enough experience with the type of experiments that were being done. So we had to use PhDs and most of them have quite a bit of experience out in the world post their postdoc period. And when they enter the data, they use a formal um, creation guidelines that we have that exists as an online wiki that uh, users can uh, look at and browse. It's um, pretty dry reading, but it <laughs> so allegedly covers everything that we encounter in the literature and it grows over time. As authors come up with new ways of doing research, uh, we will adapt our rules uh, to meet them. And we also have the peer review process I mentioned that helps keep everything being looked at at least twice by human and oftentimes if something's strange, they'll take it to other members too, and we'll have several people looking at a single paper. And then for everything uh, related to the IDB, we rely heavily on external immunological experts uh, from the design of the initial database. Each time we add a new field, if we're gonna add a new curation role, and we reach out to experts continually, and we do um, assessments of our large sets of data where we interact with uh, specialists, for example, with our non-peptidic epitopes, um, carbohydrates are something that's quite foreign to most of our teams, so we reach out to all of the carbohydrate immunologists and help review our data and how we're capturing it. And we're located at La Jolla Institute for Allergy Immunology, so we have a lot of immunologists on site that we interact with regularly, and we go out to um, conferences and we do publications. And we try and stay um, part of our user um, base, and we're also located, our database is physically located in an immunology wet lab. So we work with uh, postdocs every day and uh, get a lot of feedback from them. And then the curation interface itself has built-in validation. So as a curator enters something, it will dictate what they're allowed to enter in the next field. So the fields are, have logic between them. And then once they submit a record, there's logic that's run across the entirety of the record 
um, looking for inconsistencies. And I spend a lot of my time designing that validation, uh, primarily based on ontology, logical definitions, which I'll go into a little bit later. So the, the IDB is a database of experiments. So we start with the reference a publication and to be relevant to the IDB, you should have at least one epitope in it. And that epitope must be described in at least one experiment. So the experiments have to be shown, uh, they can be, if they're explained very well in text, we will include them, but we need to know everything about what was done. And that usually isn't the case if there aren't any figures in a paper. We will still read those papers and look. And we capture all of the experiments from the paper for all of the epitopes in there. And then the result is that we have all of these assays from many publications that we're putting together in this structured format of all of these separate fields that describe how the experiment was performed, how the epitope was uh, discovered, and proven. And to capture all of these database fields, um, we structure our data using um, formal ontologies. So ontologies are hierarchical relationships between the terms. So the terminologies have a nomenclature, specialized nomenclature um, depending on what field you're talking about. So I'll go into some detail about that for each of the ontologies we use, but they come with definitions and synonyms and logical definitions that were worked out by uh, the group, the ontology developers themselves. And there's a lot of vetting that goes on this way. And by working with these ontologies, this helps make our data more consistent and accurate because we're relying on these external experts for each of the term types. And it helps us find errors in our database based using those logical definitions. And then it makes creation easier and enhances our user experience because our curators and our end users interact with the ontology uh, rather than free text. They, the curators don't need to type things. They can choose from an ontology in a hierarchical relationship. So there's a tree that helps them find things more easily. And then if they do want to type, we have autocomplete that's built on these ontologies. So we gain all the synonyms automatically. So the curator can type just a few letters. And because that ontology has a synonym, it helps find it quickly what they were looking for. And then of course, this facilitates interoperability between our data and any of the resource that uses that same formal ontology terms. Those identifiers are key for interoperability between different data sets because there's a million ways to write something, but there's only one formal identifier. So uh, one of the many things that are very important to the IDB are proteins. So as most of our epitopes are peptidic, and this is linear peptide, they're derived from a protein. And in this case, this peptide is derived from hemagglutinin protein in influenza. And to describe the hemagglutinin protein, uh, we rely on GenBank or Uniprot to get a record that has 100% this sequence in it. But for hemagglutinin, for example, there's three to 400 different hemagglutinin records because this uh, protein is highly variable among different st uh, strains of the flu and from year to year it mutates so they will continue to grow the number of human gluten records in uh, GenBank. And all of those records are needed. The, the IDB uses more than 300 of them to capture all the wide variety of possible sequences the epitope could have. So we need them all and our curators can pick them all, but we don't want our end users having to browse 300 records. So instead we uh, link them using these uniprot reference proteomes. So all 300 hemagglutinins are grouped under the single uh, uniprot reference proteome automatically uh, using blast matching of the GenBank records to that uniprot record. And because we're relying on the expertise of the uniprot team, we get these little stars and this shows you how well annotated their, these reference proteomes are and these individual proteins were. And it, Uniproc comes with all, all sorts of other information that the curators have added. And this includes uh, processed protein fragments. So the hemagglutinin and protein is also actually broken into three pieces in real life, even though in the manuscript it only mentioned hemagglutinin and never mentioned which chain. And our curators don't need to know this. They don't need to process it or figure it out. We can automatically, by working with Uniproc's expertise, we gain how things are processed by residues that are mapped to the original GenBank entry. And we're able to make this nice pretty tree that our end users can search. And when they click on one of these chains, they get all records that match to that region of that protein. So it's actually very useful and uh, meaningful information that we gain from using Uniprot. We also gain many synonyms for all of these proteins, which there are a lot for proteins. You can say every 
protein so many different ways and we don't want to be in the business of figuring that out. So relying on Uniprot gives us a great deal. And then to describe the organism source of the epitopes, so both peptidic and non-peptidic epitopes, most of them are derived from some uh, organism. It could be um, a self uh, protein, it could be a virus, a bacteria, it could be a, a plant for pollens, it could be anything someone's allergic to. And uh, NCBag taxonomy exists as a great resource. It provides a tree structure again and an enormous amount of synonyms and really helps our curators and end users. So for example, if they type CMV, they can get human herpes 5, which is the main human CMV, without having to write out or even know that, it, that people are calling it human herpes 5. They might, not every curator is gonna know that right off the top of their head, but they type what they see in the paper and they can find what they're looking for. And it helps organize the data such that end users can search for all viral data or all uh, particular plants allergens by just the top node and then you can see which strains people are researching and for flu this is important there's so many strains that you don't want to necessarily search on each individual strain people will search on the high node and it helps organize the data really nicely and then uh, for chemicals so some epitopes are uh, things like nickel that people have allergic reactions to they are portions of a bacterial cell wall this is a carbohydrate portion of the LPS from the H. pylori. Uh, some uh, lipids are also uh, epitopes. So we use uh, the KEBI database, which is the Chemical Entities of Biological Interest. It's a database at the EBI. And we have, we're lucky enough to have a curator there who creates these structures for us. He reads the papers and he tells our curators which KEBI IDs to use. And KEBI again comes with uh, definitions, their benefit of what their team has done, and a uh, logical hierarchy created by the ontology to organize all these structures. So this helps our curators and our end users who for the most part aren't really very familiar with this terminology. And then we use the disease ontology to describe diseases relevant to the immune response. So a person with an allergy will have a different immune response to someone who's not allergic to the same thing or someone who's had uh, malaria will have an antibody response to a malaria plasmodium protein where someone who's never had malaria won't. So these diseases are relevant to why the immune reaction was the way it was. And we use the disease ontology, which again provides definitions and synonyms and link outs to other uh, resources and logical definitions that have relationships between what's causing the disease. So um, plasmodium falciparum is the causative agent of malaria. So there'll be a link between the immunogen, the causative agent of the disease and the disease state, and we use that in our logical definition, our logical validation, the where a curator shouldn't put that the wrong thing caused the disease. So a peanut allergy reaction should not be caused by a chicken egg, which is something you have an allergy to, but it doesn't cause a peanut allergy. And then the database is primarily about assays, and we describe experimental assays using the ontology for biomedical investigations, which we're heavily involved in developing. We've added more than 400 experiments to OB, and uh, as new uh, experiments come up in the literature developed by end users, uh, we add them to OB again, and then we rely on this tree, and it really helps our curators. They can find exactly what they're looking for, and it helps the end users uh, easily uh, search on large uh, groups of assays or very specific assays. So they could search for all cytokine experiments or they can search specifically for IL-2 experiments and they wouldn't need to care what platform is used, but our curators can still find what they're looking for. And then uh, this is MHC restriction ontology describes that MHC molecules that are really important to the immune response in different human populations. And uh, when we uh, first started capturing these, we just used free text and we had a list of many, many different ways of saying the same thing. As you can see the nomenclature for this is human MHC involves um, asterisks, colons, and slashes. And for each species, you have a very different nomenclature. So it was really important to get this nomenclature correct. So we developed an MHC restriction ontology because we happen to have in-house expertise on this subject and we rely heavily on uh, for other species um, other experts we collaborated with them to make sure we got the nomenclature right for all of the different species but this is the sort of thing we never would want a curator to have to type to get correct and we certainly wouldn't expect our end users to be able to write this all out perfectly either and for the most part in their publications these are generally um, 
written incorrectly. They um, use shorthand, they forget the colons, they forget the asterisks. So um, by showing our end users the proper way to write things every time they search the IDB or the exported IDB data set, we're hoping that we're helping spread the correct nomenclature as well, but also helping um, because the ontologies come with a hierarchical tree structure, they can search um, and get to what they're looking for without needing to know exactly the proper nomenclature. And then the goal of the IDB is to put all the data together in one place. So after the curators have read the paper and structured it properly using these ontologies, we now have a database um, full of experiments from different uh, publications. So a single epitope may have been tested in many papers, and sometimes the papers will actually agree and you get additive data. So you can see that this peptide always caused T-cell proliferation. It also caused IL-2 release. So it's a good, um, strong T-cell epitope. But sometimes papers will disagree, and even sometimes with the same paper, you'll get experiments that have different outcomes. So this peptide has two different antibody responses, one positive and negative. But all of the rich detail that we capture is really important to help explain that because the positive response may have been in a mouse, and the negative response may have been in a human, or a positive might have been the IgG response, and the negative might have been the IgM response. So you really, it's really important for end users um, to perform sophisticated queries and look in detail in the data um, when they make their conclusions about how epitopes are recognized. So this is our website. There's a search pane that includes all the search for all the data that we've added. And then we also have uh, host epitope uh, prediction tools and there's a whole pane um, to search for those. And that's gonna be a different person's topic in a future talk. I'm just gonna talk about searching the data that we have using the search pane. I'll go briefly over each section. So the search for the epitope itself is actually the one that's most commonly used. Most people come to the IDB with a specific peptide that they want to search on. They want to see if it's recognized by antibody or T cells. They want to see if it's been studied in a particular experiment type or a particular um, population group or mouse strain. So they tend to put in a peptide and we allow them to look uh, for different homology matches. So it, blasting the injured peptide the, in the in the in LVP peptide, at 80%, we got 46 hits because authors uh, test things in very different fashions. Some authors may always test the minimum, some may have longer peptides, some may mutate a few residues. So it's useful for people that they're able to look at all of the similar peptides ever tested and see how that uh, differs the response based on the length and based on particular amino acid changes. And then the next most popular used uh, search interface is the organism, the antigen. What protein is the peptide from? I want to say you want to look at all um, epitopes ever studied from this non-structural protein, or you want to look at all epitopes ever studied from the CMV virus. Um, those two types of queries are very common. And when uh, people look and do the query, they can see what sorts of species and proteins we have data for. So this NS1 protein, you can see it's something that's present in many viruses. And many of these proteins are actually highly homologous to each other. So if uh, there isn't much data on what you're looking for, so for example, Zika virus didn't have a lot of data when it initially became a problem. So that dengue virus was very homologous and a lot of the dengue data has proven uh, to be uh, useful and predictive for Zika uh, immune responses. So the, the next search pane is for the host, whose immune response is being measured. And we have all data from the literature for any um, vertebrate that there was a mean response measured. So we have human data, mouse data, obviously rabbits and, and uh, hamsters, but we also have um, cats and dogs and horses and camels and sharks and any, any animal that someone wants to study and publish on, we will take it, We're not, we don't discriminate. And we have all of the different mouse strains that are described from the literature and uh, standardizing these is an ongoing project because authors will write mouse strains so many different ways, but we do our best and we're working with NGI to try and make this better. But we have any strain that anybody wants to search and any species, and for humans, we also um, give information as to where the human's from. And then the experiment type. Uh, a lot of researchers care only about T cell responses or only about antibody responses. So we let them uh, choose that they just wanna see that type of data. It's also really useful to um, compare the T cell response and the antibody response for certain um, types of diseases you want to uh, enhance one and, and not enhance the other. And we allow um, search by uh, autocomplete. If you just start typing, you can see all of the similar experiments here. I'm type, 
interferon. You can see that I have interferon beta and gamma. And there's also a little finder button where if you click find, then you see the ontology view. So this is the embedded OB ontology as a tree structure that allows for the searching of the tree. So they have that full capability either way. And similarly, MHC restriction is the same thing. We have some radio buttons for the major groups that people might be interested in. Some people are only interested in the class one response or class two response. So I'm not really gonna go into the different types of T cell responses today. <laughs> Uh, but you can search for all of the different MHC the molecules for which we have data. You can see this is the link to the ontology identifier of the MRO. And then again, they can click the finder and then they see the tree structure and you can see for what species we have data and then uh, class one and class two separately. And then here you can also see the difference in the nomenclature of the, this is a cow. Their nomenclature is different from that human in that there's no colons here, but there's still an asterisk and there's more digits uh, provided. And then on disease search, uh, you can search for um, in general disease categories of autoimmune disease or allergy, or you can search for specific disease by typing it. And you can see we have both data on Alzheimer's and Zika and schizophrenia. So the, all the data that's, if it's in the literature, will capture that um, disease state. So again, when Zika first became an issue, it did not, we had zero data on it, but now we have quite a bit because people have been publishing it and we'll keep up with whatever gets published. And then again, that you can open and see the finder view, which some people might just want to search on a particular node of that tree. And we do include the animal models of disease also. And then uh, once you hit search, so on that uh, homepage, you, you pick the criteria of what you're interested in and you hit the big green search button, you get a results page. And in the results page, we have several tabs of data that are the results that are relevant to your search. In this case, the search was just all positive assays. And uh, each epitope will have a epitope details that takes you to another page. And on every tab, you can export the results into an Excel. And there's two forms of export that I'll talk about later. So if you click this epitope details, you get to a page for each epitope that summarizes all the data from all of the references that we've curated. And it gives you an overview of that epitope, how many uh, 3D structures does it have, uh, what types of assays it's been tested in. So this one's been tested heavily. It's from flu, so it's very popular. Oh, no, sorry, CMV. But it's very heavily studied. It's been studied for many different MHC molecules, um, all human and uh, if it had no MHC molecules, this section of the table wouldn't be here. And then there's B cell responses, T cell responses, and you can click directly to all of the assays. And then at the bottom of the page, we have link outs to other resources that have related data. And then uh, going back to the results page, that was the epitopes on the antigens tab. This is the source of that epitope. So what protein or larger structure did that epitope come from? So we have all of the antigens summarized again by the Uniprot reference proteome protein names, which is helpfully uh, standardized across all the different protein names that are possible in GenBank. And then what organism they came from and a summary of how many epitopes were tested from each uh, protein. And as you can guess, uh, flu has an awful lot of research done on it, but so does hepatitis C. So you see uh, patterns as to what people are studying. And uh, we have two features, again, the export, but also we have, you can narrow your results to a single uh, protein, and that's what the filter's for, but we have this little um, graph icon that takes you to something that's pretty cool. It's our Immunome browser. And the Immunome browser plots all of the data from your query along the length of that protein. So this is a uh, pollen allergen, and this is the length of that protein from amino acid one to the end. And we plot how frequently it's been studied and how often it was positive or negative. So this region of the protein with the red line um, has been studied quite frequently and it was generally negative where there's another a region around amino acid 20 something, it becomes positive. So this little region was recognized and this is a T cell response. So a different, if you plotted the graph for an antibody response, a different region might be positive or negative or it may not have been studied as highly. And this is also in humans, if you did the same plot for a bob seed mice, you might get a very different response. So it's a very uh, interesting way of looking at the data and putting it together across all of the experiments from the literature. It makes for a great summary of what's been done so far and what's been shown. And then going back to the results, now I'm showing the assay tab and I wanted to highlight that our, at the top we have, we show all the filters, a lot, a lot of websites do the sort of thing where you can see what your query was 
and you can exit off if you would like to and then redo the query again uh, up at the top. And then again, you can export results and you can click on the um, detail and go to the details for the experiments. So as a database of experiments, when you click on the ID for the details of the experiments, you get a lot of detail. It's an enormous amount of detail, which I'm gonna go into uh, really quick, hopefully. So the first section in the details of the assay is just about the reference, where that data came from. We always want to attribute the data back to the original authors who did the experiments. It wasn't us. Um, we just got it from this PubMed ID and we link out to that PubMed ID. And the next section is about the epitope. What was the outcome of that experiment? What was the epitope being tested? And we tell you as much as we can about the epitope, um, what protein it came from, what organism it came from and uh, additional information that the curator can add, like what the authors called it in that paper, if they gave it a name, um, what section of the, the manuscript did they get this epitope sequence from, if it was in a table or a figure or just the method section. And we are working on linking these back to those actual locations in the paper um, to be able to open the figures uh, in the future. And then the host, whose immune response is being measured, in this case it was humans with an allergy, um, we would capture whatever disease they have, um, where they live in the world, what geolocation, their age, uh, their gender, um, whatever the authors provide. Um, if the authors don't provide anything, we'll just have that as a human, but um, we always hope that they'll give us more information than we will write authors if um, we think it will help us get more detail. And then we describe the experiment itself, what type of antibodies or what type of T cells were being measured. Um, where did they come from? How were they treated before the experiment? In this case, if it's a T cell, does it have an MHC restriction? And then what was the assay antigen being measured? Was it the epitope or an organism? It could be a cell that's being bound by an antibody. And then um, I wanted to point out that we also have um, 3D assays. So some of the experiments in the IDB um, describe a 3D structure that's been entered into PubMed, into PDB. And those are interesting to certain types of experimentalists. And we have tried to be up to date with every single antibody TCR or MHC binding structure that is in PDB. We cure, uh, query not only PubMed, but we also um, query the PDB every month to see if any new antibody or TCR or MHC structures have been deposited where they're shown to bind a specific ligand, like what was being bound in that exact experiment that was entered. And if you see the 3D structure, you can also do a query for all data that has 3D structures. But if you see the 3D icon and you click on it, then you, you go to a viewer um, that shows that structure, uh, what are the contact residues between the epitope and the MHC, the TCR to the MHC, the TCR to the epitope. The little yellow balls are the, where the epitope is contacting the TCR. So those would be the most important residues for recognition. So mutating those would alter the recognition of that epitope. And then um, second to last tab in our results is the receptors. So this is something that's pretty new to the IDE that we're now um, capturing the sequences of the T cell receptors and the sequences of the antibodies. This is something that suddenly become uh, much more affordable for researchers to get at. They can sequence these in large uh, vats now. So we get, we get a lot of this data coming in and the CDR3s are the main contact regions of the TCR or the antibody. So we show them on this uh, brief tab tabular view on the re uh, results page. But clicking on the um, details link will take you to a page with more details about all of the uh, other CDR3s, CDR1, CDR2, and uh, the gene usage and the full length receptor sequence if we have it, and any other information that the authors gave us for that receptor. And you can again export these as always. Then the last results tab is the references and you can export uh, a full uh, list of all of the relevant papers to your query. So you may just do a very superficial query of I'm just interested in epitopes from a specific organism and then export this list of uh, papers and you can scan through them at your le leisure or use them as a citation analysis. And then uh, once you've done a query from the homepage on the results page, we have um, several search panes that allow you to narrow your results even further. So in the epitope tab, we add uh, a finder that you can access all the non-peptidic epitope data. It's not as highly um, searched as the peptide data, but we still wanna make sure people can get at it. You can do the search for all 3D structured data. You can uh, add the ability to look at any modifications to those specific amino acids in the linear peptide. And then the whole new um, search tab for those receptor sequences 
lets you narrow down what type of CDR3 uh, you're looking for, antibody, which chain, heavy chain, alive chain, or alpha or beta T cell chain, and the full link sequence or the um, short sequence. And then on the reference tab, we let people um, search by specific author name and uh, title. And if you uh, click on a journal article, you would get ability to search by PubMed ID and other information that's relevant to just the journal articles. And then you can export all of the IDB. Um, any, re any results you have, you can export it and we allow you to export with or without these IRIs, which are the links to the ontology terms that each um, type of data point is linked to. So this, these antigen names are linked to these Unipro IDs. And here you can see uh, there's additional ontology terms behind the scene. In the assay details, we never show people that um, all tissue types are linked actually to ontology terms and all cell types are linked to ontology terms. But when you do the export, you can get access to all of that. And all the IDB is fully um, exportable in many formats. So you can take the entire database. Um, we're here just to serve, so we don't have any privacy issues. We want people to take the data and do what, with it whatever they want. Many people use the data to design uh, prediction tools, and that's our goal. We love to see that happen. And you can take it in every form, in every format is convenient to you, and we help people um, use these. We accept emails from humans and answer them and help them with their exports. And uh, one thing that the IDB does continuously is we recreate data. So our curators are getting new papers every week and adding new data. We're always looking back. Um, we're looking back to early curated papers. We're adding new data fields. So we go back to the old data and add new data that wasn't there. We always look for new ways to have consistency and uniformity by adding new validation checks. Every year we add new validation rules. And if we find something wrong with old data, we want to fix it. We take um, requests from users if they think something looks funny, we'll go look at it. Um, we really want to make our data to be as accurate as we can, given that it is all human entered. And I mentioned that we, our new focus on uh, antibody and TCR sequences. Um, now that this data is coming out more uh, rapidly in the literature, we've added new data tables and those new search interfaces and the new results uh, pages to show the chain types, the full sequences, the short sequences, the gene usage. And we're doing this for all newly curated data that comes uh, from new publications, but we're uh, going back to the past literature and trying to find every case that we have could potentially add this because it's very useful and people are using it uh, to design um, immunotherapies, say for um, cancer, you can uh, design a certain TCR receptor uh, to recognize a particular uh, cancer antigen or for um, autoimmune diseases. It's very helpful to know what the antibody is responding to um, in someone with autoimmune disease. And then lastly, uh, the immune uh, epitope database also can host all these prediction tools that someone else will talk about, but the main point is that the, your uh, immune receptors are recognized specific epitopes and the, what epitopes are recognized can be predicted. And our large data sets really help drive these prediction tools. And uh, because the T cells recognize the epitopes in the context of MHC molecules, we have uh, prediction tools that predict which peptides will be processed by APC. So based on a, the length of a protein, you can guess which peptides are likely to be, uh, how it's be chopped up, what pieces will be made. And then you can secondly pr predict which ones will be presented by the MHC molecule. Because the MHC molecule has its own uh, set of, uh, it's a protein itself, two protein chains, and it can tell you which is like, what peptides are likely to be bound by it. And then again, you can predict which like which combination is likely to be recognized by the T cell. And then for antibodies, we can also predict uh, based on the shapes of the protein and which regions of the protein uh, protrude and their um, characteristics, which ones are likely to be recognized by antibodies. So um, all of our data gets used in this way um, on an ongoing basis where tools are trained every year with new data and new tools are being designed all the time. And then special thanks to our entire team um, this is a big team effort. We have a lot of people at the Hoya Institute. Um, we also work with Lidos as our programming uh, team and uh, the Danish Technical Institute as many of our programmers. And we collaborate with lots of other people. So I to thank everyone. And that's all I have. So are there questions? Should I? Thank you very much, Hi. Dr. Vita. And I'll let Anita take the reins for a moment. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Devin. Um, yeah, so I've got a couple of questions. I mean, um, I was just kind of furiously writing down things while I was um, 
and my notes are really, really poorly organized here. But there's a, a bunch of things that um, certainly come to mind. One of them was uh, your negative data. So you mentioned um, a little bit about your negative data, but you didn't really go into it. And um, you know, that's one of the places where uh, there's a really, really good reason to have databases because um, we have this this major problem with negative data. Um, and uh, you know, basically the lack of it from uh, from the published literature. Right. Um, so, can you talk a little bit more about that? Can you give me some numbers in terms of you know whether or not you're you're seeing a lot of neg negative data? Um, like, uh, just certainly this is you know this is some some place where um, I think IEDB and many other databases will be able to kind of round out the science a little bit. Well, it's something that we definitely talk, thought about um, when we started the database as the value to it, because uh, publications tend to just focus on the few most positive epitopes. And if that's all that's ever comes out into literature, everyone is going to keep testing those negative regions and wasting their time and money. And the NIH is really behind this. Um, they don't like that. If they, if they're giving you money for funding. They want you to be efficient. So they want that negative data out there so that people can use it. And also it depends on the context. So this epitope might not be recognized in a person who doesn't have diabetes, but it may be recognized in a person who does have diabetes. So that negative data is super valuable in that case. So uh, in, in the literature, because there's not so much of it, uh, we do make sure we capture all um, supplemental tables, but we will contact authors. So that's something that we're, we, it takes a lot of effort. This is a, definitely a, hands-on large-scale manual effort so if a curator reads a paper and the author says we tested overlapping peptides scanning this whole protein but they only give you the two positive ones our curators will write the author and say do you happen to have the rest of them and whether you know what their outcome was that's something we routinely do to get that data out of them and and they generally if it's because now we're only doing recent papers we have a pretty good response rate and also because we've been doing it a while, so maybe that the author has been um, contacted by curators in the past a couple times. So now they're finally, they give in and accept that they need to respond with us. So we have pretty good um, success in getting that data out of people. And okay. it, is, it is very useful like for making the tools and for saving time and for seeing you know, that, that this has been tested over and over again and this protein is just not gonna cause an immune response. And that can be useful for people trying to avoid immune responses also. So yeah. that's, that's actually an area we didn't really think much about because initially we were focusing on infectious diseases and we really wanted to show which regions of proteins are going to cause immune response. But now that that data is in there, it's been very useful for people trying to make sure they're not going to have adverse reactions. That's great. No, thank you so much. And, and um, you know, that really clarifies for me also part of your workflow and your process because, again, sitting there and thinking about, well, where, why don't, why do we even need databases, right? Because this, this question does come up um, uh, here and there, and because people don't understand them in a lot of the, uh, a lot of the time. But when you have databases like IEDB and um, MGI and so many others, um, many of them you've pointed out, and you know, thanks for for uh, your shout out to all of them. That's great. Um, but it's uh, it, it's this is where the real power is because. A lot of this data is very well hidden, sometimes in desk drawers. Um, if if you know somebody doesn't go out there and say, "Hey, did you happen to have that?" So um, that thank you uh, for that. That's a, a tremendous amount of work, and and thanks for doing it. I go, because you said so, that, I want to go to this where this slide and that slide, this slide. This yeah, slide is possible if you just read the papers. You know, you really need to align all the different peptides that the authors stated at different positions. And um, we map, you know, by putting all that data in the database structure, we're able to collate it together and aggregate it um, accurately so that we know exactly, you know, this region was tested. And if this was a, a live, this is a slide, if this was a live, when you mouse over this, it tells you what amino acid that was, and, and you'll know how many papers and what papers tested it. Mm -hmm. So no, that's, that's this is tremendous. the power of putting all everyone's data together. <laughs> yeah, no, this is really incredibly cool. Um, so actually, as a follow up to that, um, the uh, the Human Protein Atlas. Um, do you work with that data? Do you have a lot of the? Because they actually have a lot of the epitope sequences. Yeah, I wonder. Um, 
I wonder where they're getting that from. I think it was a full scale effort. I think that was funded um, out of e out of EU, and then um, but all of those epitopes, I have them, um, uh, and I'm sure you can get it uh, again from from um, others. But if that's but and um, then they have the associated uh, you know antibody information with them and and all of that other stuff. So if their data uh, comes from a publication then we yeah. should have it. If it doesn't, if it if it's just was created and put into that Alice, um, we may not. But we have in the past taken uh, dumps from other resources, mm -hmm. uh, accessed their data and shunted over and formatted into the IDB. And then um, also cite them where it came from and maybe link back to their data point on their site. We do do that on a regular <coughs> ongoing basis. We have used them uh, mostly for looking at, we were, we're very interested in where peptides are expressed in protein, especially for um, self, so say like an autoimmune or a cancer antigen, where in the body it's expressed. And we had used the protein atlas to look at that. Right, exactly. And so I was, um, I was just, you know, again, wondering you know, whether or not you, um, you had that data already. If not, I'm happy to either, you know, point you at it or um, just, send it to you um and and i'll send you the the information of the people as well associated they're great mm -hmm. um and so uh that brings me to my uh ever present point <laughs> mm -hmm. which is um you know nomenclature and the uses of nomenclature oh, um, yes. I, i'm glad you're working with mgi they're great people over there um yeah and, uh, a tremendous amount of work on um, trying to figure out, you know, which which mouse mouse strains everybody's using, mm -hmm. um, and of course we have similar kinds of issues with um, antibodies. With um, and uh, and as you know, we have the RID project, which is trying mm -hmm. to align how people talk about their mice and their antibodies. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you briefly address how that could or could not help you, or you know, what are what are your thoughts? Well, we we struggle with um, nomenclature because you naively think that the authors will say what they did in their paper, and <laughs> as you know, that's often not the case. <laughs> Sometimes it gets to experts, yeah. So um, we will contact authors to try and find out what they actually used, but we would love it if they would put that in the paper or they would formally identify it to paper. So when authors put in our IDs and papers, that makes our life easier, and it's only uh, recently starting to become more common, which is uh, very promising and um, whenever I see those journals that do that in person at conferences I always go up and thank them and hope that they're oh, that's so awesome <laughs> but um, you'd be very busy at Society for Neuroscience <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's good to encourage that and uh, with nomenclature we really struggle because even working with the effort the experts like say MGI for the mice and the RGD for rats mm -hmm. um, when they look at the papers, they can't make heads or tails out of what authors are saying either, because the journal, the journal and the reviewer didn't uh, scrutinize what was written there and the methods about what mouse that was. You, you often can't tell. And so we have to limit sometimes to go to a higher level mm -hmm. to say it was a mouse or it was a Bob C mouse, but we can't tell you what else after that, even though yeah. stuff was mentioned. So we do, we do, our computers do put free text. And we have uh, been able to use that extra free text in some cases to, in the future, um, fix things mm -hmm. to where something becomes more standardized and then we can kind of tease apart what they actually used. Um, but I also want to say, like, for the antibodies for RRDs, I don't think I show an antibody column because uh, this was a T-cell export. But in an antibody export, um, we would have a column for the antibody name and we have a column that we will put an RRID when we get one. Uh, mm -hmm. so that it could be linked directly. Cool. Um, very, very getting cool. Those, getting those ID, the maps is hard, as you know. Like it's oh, like, yes. <laughs> well, if, um, students, if, if you do work with anybody me. listening who's a student, uh, <laughs> working with students who like to find IDs for things, it is rewarding. It, it is very true. It is. Um, and if you do work with the HPA data, I mean, all of it is registered with us already. So then oh, there will cool. be a whole bunch. Well, thank you so much, Randy. I really um, actually enjoyed this webinar and um, made a lot of attention. And uh, you have, uh, I think, given at least me a much better idea of what is inside of the IEDB and how you handle the data that you, um, that you actually handle. 
So um, thank you very much again for uh, joining us for this webinar. And I think next week we're going to hear um, a little bit about the tools and some of the uh, pipelines. Right, Devin? Correct. And that'll be with Dr. Sinu Paul. It'll be yeah. on June 29th at 11 a.m. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Vita. And once again, this will be on YouTube later today. So I'll send you that link and we'll put it out through our social media as well. Thanks so much. All right. Have a great weekend. Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye.